Welcome back, everybody, to the Monkey's Hour. My name is Paris Dactieres, and I'm joined by John DeMeo. This week, we have a special treat for you. Our guest is a very important person in monkeydom. He produced some of the finer monkey songs, which include Daydream Believer, Pleasant Valley Sunday, and Going Down. In addition, he helped silence the critics' complaints against the monkey's credibility as a musical entity with the album appropriately titled Headquarters. We welcome Douglas Farthing Hadalid, better known as Chip Douglas, to our show. Welcome aboard, Chip. Hi, thank you very much. I'm glad to be aboard. Chip, it's been 20 years, but the music of the monkeys still lives. Are you in any way surprised by the resurgence of the monkeys? I am very surprised at their popularity now, you know, but uh, then again, uh, something in me is not surprised because those TV shows were pretty good, and uh, once those have resurfaced, I guess there's a whole other market for the monkeys of people who kind of never heard of them or weren't even born yet when <laughs> they first came out and now they're having a resurgence you know and there's a whole bunch of other kids including my son who's five who loves the monkeys you know and that doesn't even had never heard of them before during your involvement with the monkeys were you aware at the time that the music was going to be special years later uh you know i just i kind of had no idea at that point what what would happen in the future i was so wrapped up in just trying to get the uh, tunes down on tape and get enough tunes to the record company which was always on my uh, back to get more tunes you know that was the main thing they were writing me about there just kind of wasn't a lot of time to to work on a lot of stuff with the monkeys because they filmed 12 hours a day and and that it really ate up a lot of the energy they had but uh, during that period we made headquarters they they took off from the tv show which was the only time they did that so it allowed them to concentrate on the music uh, entirely and uh, you know making and playing their own album and doing all their own uh, instruments on it and stuff so uh, without that though without the time off from the tv show we just would have never been able to uh, have made that album i don't think it was just a matter of everybody would have been sound asleep <laughs> when we were in the studio you know Chip, going back to the wonderful year of 1967, give us a nutshell version of how you, with no previous production experience, became the Monkees' producer. Well, I was uh, I was in the Turtles at the time. I just uh, I've been playing bass with them for about three months and uh, toured around the country and a little bit and was in the Whiskey a Go Go one night on a personal appearance and all of a sudden I saw Mike Nesmith walk up to me, who I had met before, and I knew him, and then, of course, I knew him as a monkey, uh, and uh, he said, you know, we need a new producer, and uh, I've just singled you out. I think you can do it, you know, and I, I was really, you know, it's one of those things that it just seems so incredibly a lucky break or whatever that I just kind of couldn't believe it, you know. I said, now, come on now, you know, you're really putting me on this. This can't be true, you know. I just... It was it was something I, I I just really didn't believe it you know, and uh, I said you know I don't know anything about it you know I haven't the slightest idea how to produce a record or anything. He said never mind I'll teach you all you need to know. And as it turned out I guess I, you know I I I had instincts as to how to produce records just from being involved in other recording sessions uh, prior to that time with the different groups I was with the Turtles and the Modern Folk Quartet and stuff and. So I, you know, it, uh, I just fell right into it, and pretty soon I found myself editing takes together, <laughs> 20 takes into one good take uh, <laughs> on the first couple of things we did, you know. But that that was, in a, you know, in a nutshell, how it just happened. He just walked up to me suddenly in the whiskey and, uh, you know, said, you, we need you. So there I was. Before being discovered by Michael Nesmith, it's been documented in David Jones's book that he and Lester Still saw you perform at a club and considered you as a possible member of the Monkees. Is this true? Yeah, I believe it is. Uh, Davey had told me at one point that uh, they had come in and were looking for people, you know, and uh, Davey, for some reason, suggested me, and I guess they had been over the they were familiar with the group I'd been playing with and had seen us from time to time. And so uh, myself and Jerry Yester, who was also in our group, were considered, I guess. Uh, Jerry more so than me, I think. I was, uh, I, I think I was just Davy's idea, you know. Uh, it was between me and uh, Jerry for some reason. And then they kind of singled out Jerry later on. And uh, uh, I don't know if he ever auditioned, but he, 
he turned it down and he, he said he wouldn't do it unless the entire group could be in the uh, TV series or be the monkeys or something. Our, he was very dedicated to the group we had at the time, as we all were, really. Chip, how would you felt personally if you were, let's say, selected to be one of the original monkeys? Well, I, it's hard to say. You know, it's one of those things that uh, never happened. I, I, I might have been thrilled, you know. I kind of wondered how, about that from time to time. I don't know how I would have done. I don't, I don't think I would have lasted somehow as a, as a monkey. I don't know why. I was uh, just not, it was not something that was meant for me, I guess. You know, I was better off being the producer. So, uh, you know, uh, when that came along, that's where I fit in. I kind of was the fifth monkey for a while there anyway, you know. It would have been fun to have auditioned, and I would have been flattered, and who knows, I would have uh, taken one step at a time. I, I never thought of myself as a comedy actor, though, you know, and uh, and the other guys really were, you know, they're quite. I probably would have gotten the Peter Tork part, <laughs> if anything. Now, what was your personal view of the monkeys musically and conceptually before your involvement? Well, I had I had heard Clarksville. I hadn't really bought any of their albums, and I hadn't listened to a lot of their stuff. But I was hearing them on the radio, you know, and I, I kind of, you know, I just, I didn't have much of an opinion one way or another. I know I liked Clarksville. I was impressed by all the guitar parts. You know, I'm a guitar player too, as well as a bass player, and so I, you know, I was impressed by the sound of that, and I could, you know, I liked that a whole lot, that Clarksville. And then the other thing started happening, and I was, uh, the, it was into I'm a Believer by the time I came along, I think. And, uh, you know, uh, but nothing impressed me as much as uh, Last Train at Clarksville for some reason. And I used to hear I Want to Be Free, too, and I, I, I liked that a lot, you know, and uh, more so in later years. I kind of got into that one, and, uh, and, you know, I appreciated that one a little bit more, you know. But mainly Clarksville was what I you know, had heard a lot and was quite impressed by. Chip, you were at the Beverly Hills Hotel when everything seemed to explode between Don Kirshner, the monkeys, and yourself. Could you tell us your version of this story? Well, I uh, <clears throat> went into the Beverly Hills Hotel and had a meeting with uh, Don Kirshner and uh, his lawyer, and uh, Lester Sill was sitting there on the side. He was quietly just kind of minding his own business. He was sort of stuck in the middle. His first words to me when I met Lester uh, if, just before we had this Beverly Hills meeting, he said, you know, as you know, there's a war going on between New York and Los Angeles. I said, you know, what war? You know, and he's, well, you know, the people that uh, started the monkeys' music, Don Kirshner, and, you know, and the monkeys, they're having this big feud, and they, you know, so I got right in the middle of that war. Anyway, we, we sat down, and Don came out, and he was very nice, but he, uh, again, uh, most of the time was spent with him kind of asserting his position as being the musical mastermind of the monkeys, you know, and he said, now there are certain, I remember this quote, there are certain decisions with regard to the uh, various tunes and things like this that will be performed by the boys uh, that uh, will remain mine, <laughs> you know, and well, fine, you know, I said, I'm just, you know, I'm just coming along for the ride here. I didn't, you know, I didn't ask to do this. I was just called in by Mike Nesmith, and here I am. You know, you guys tell me what you want, you know, and they they kind of were trying to uh, grind me down to as low a rate as possible uh, for a producer, which uh, turned out to be one and a half percent instead of the normal two. It was, I keep, I remember this other quote. Don curses it, or, or his lawyer said at some point, says, it's like we're offering you a point and a half of the Beatles, Chipper. You know, I said, it's that big. It's like a point and a half of the Beatles. And I said, well, okay, fine. You know, and when I talked to my lawyer later, he said, well, what are you going to do? You know, it's one and a half percent is better than nothing, you know, so you might as well just take it. So I did. I could have held out for two percent or two and a half or probably three. You know, the monkeys wanted me. I could have, I, I didn't realize at the time I probably could have had anything I wanted. So Nowadays, when I get royalty checks from uh, Monkey's Records that are reselling, they uh, they all say less 25% as per suing to Screen Gems' uh, production contract of 1967 and so forth, you know. So that's uh, that hurts a little bit sometimes. But uh, anyway, it's uh, I, I don't regret it, you know. I, it's, it's been very rewarding uh, having produced the Monkey's. And, oh, I guess uh, they, uh, the other thing about the... That's, that's mainly the main points about the meeting, you know, and his lawyer was very anxious to 
get my lawyer on the phone, and I, I, when it came to talking the percentages and things, and I said, well, you know, I really don't know what would be proper for me to get. They were offering me 1.5%. I said, I, I really don't know. Let's take this up with uh, my lawyer. I said, and so Don Kirshner's lawyer pipes up, and he says, well, what the, what's his name? What's his name? You know, he's a very fast-talking little lawyer guy, you know, and he said, well, what's his name? What's his name? I said, well, uh, Martin Cohen is his name. Marty Cohen, let's get him on the phone. Let's get him on the phone right now. You know, so it's like one of those kind of things, you know, it was just a high, high-level high bi- business meeting, you know, so uh, we never did get him on the phone at that, at that particular time. I guess he wasn't in, and we just resolved that later, but, you know, it was, it was kind of... <laughs> Lester Sill was quietly sitting in the corner, buttering his piece of toast and trying not to get involved in the middle of it, you know. And the other thing I remember of that meeting was uh, Don Kirshner played me some of the later things that he said, these are some of the latest things that have come in for the monkeys. And one of them was uh, a little bit me, a little bit you, I think. And uh, I, I don't know, I wasn't too impressed by that for some reason. I, you know, I... I, everything struck me as so bubblegum, you know, all those songs that he was playing for me. And then the other one he played was uh, that Sugar Sugar that later became a hit for the Archies. You know, he he said, now these are some of the things that have come in for the monkeys we'd like you to produce with the boys. And I, I just heard that Sugar Sugar, and I, you know, I just thought that was the the epitome of the the world's most bubblegum song. You know, honey, you are my candy girl. You know, you got me wanting you. You know, I was I was floored. I thought, my God, this guy wants the monkeys to record this stuff. You know, it's 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 amazing to me. And uh, and so that it went from there. You know, and uh, we never did record either of those songs, or I never did with the group for some reason. It just, you know, we just did other things. I don't know. We were more into. I don't know. I, I suppose at the time I was more into sort of message, sort of songs and things like that. I, you know, I, that kind of stuff appealed to me. I was uh, not rebelling against the commerciality of it all, but uh, you know, that often would hit me over the head. Thinking, geez, you know, it's it's so, it's it's just done for the money. You know, all of this stuff, isn't it? You know, and a lot of it, it seemed. But uh, anyway, well, somewhere along the line, we came up with uh, a few good things, which were. Sort of bubblegum, too, as I look back, you know, but uh, it's, you know, it's, my son loves it, looking back, and it's, it was for the young, real young kids, you know, that the monkeys uh, were designed, and it, you know, uh, I, I have no regrets about anything, but, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I'd probably look for more bubblegum songs, you know, <laughs> to record with them, I guess, that seemed to be what everybody wanted them to do, you know. <laughs> and one of the first things you recorded with the group was all of your toys, and, and it had been a lost relic until Rhino released it earlier in the year. In 67, was it a disappointment that this single was shelved because it wasn't a Screen Gems copyright? Yeah, it kind of was. We had a we had high hopes with that, you know. That seemed like a kind of a something that the Beatles might have done, you know, and we were trying to put little parts in there that were like paperback writer, you know, and it was rough because uh, you know again we were that was the first thing we ever worked on i there were maybe the second we might have worked on the girl i knew somewhere prior to that but it was in the same session we did both of those songs at gold star recording studios which is now gone i guess and uh but you know yeah i was well i was glad to hear that it finally came out you know but it was disappointing you know that those kind of things those publishing things get in the way you know and uh I don't know if that uh, fellow that owned the publishing, uh, what was his name, Eddie Tickner, had settled for a little less, you know, it might have happened for Bill Martin at the time, and uh, uh, it didn't, you know, it was a big disappointment to him, uh, especially because he wrote the song, you know, and he was about to get the next monkey single, and it never materialized for him until much later, you know, so... What was it like when you first got qu- Yeah, go ahead. What was it like when you first got them into the studio for the headquarters sessions because they were as unfamiliar playing as a band together as you were at producing? Well, it was kind of rough at first. Uh Mickey was kind of tense on the drums and uh Peter, you know, did all right on the piano and stuff. He was uh, he was he's a good versatile musician, you know, he played guitar and everything. And it was just it was kind of, we didn't know what we were doing and what kind of a sound we wanted and who to get to play what. And at first we had uh, Mike's uh, good friend, John London, playing some bass with the with the, the group, you know. And then uh, for some reason he, I guess I got in there and started playing bass after a while. I just felt like at, in those days I was so used to being a bass player that I wanted to, uh, you know, play with them. It was the only way I felt I could kind of, 
keep the thing together was to give them some sort of a solid foundation of sound to you know build upon because Mickey wasn't that steady a drummer and that was the main thing that was a little bit difficult was Mickey's drumming was uh, he was inexperienced at the time he's become a much better drummer now you know and is uh, more relaxed about it and it's second nature to him but at the time he was just starting into the drums and it was that was the roughest part I think was finding the steady beat you know and but uh, it came together after a while you know certain songs were easier than others for some reason and uh, but the first sessions were rough when nobody we weren't used to each other or anything and here we were all on our own you know and there was a big lawsuit going on with Don Kirshner and all of this stuff and uh, you know it was it was it was kind of tense at times you know and but uh, very it was a wonderful time you know and they had a lot of love for that project that they were doing they wanted to succeed at uh, playing their own instruments so they were very determined now the album tracks on headquarters are some of the monkey's best songs out of great tunes like you just may be the one no time and for pete's sake why wasn't a single ever pulled with the lp at number one any single would have been a surefire hit yeah i guess it would have uh they just i don't know either they didn't Lester Sill was kind of in charge of what was going to be released as a single, and I guess he just didn't hear something that he felt would would have been a good single at the time. Uh, also, they felt that uh, it would help sell the album, I think, uh, was to not release a single for some reason. It was just sort of, they were so popular with the show that it they, they just kind of didn't need a single right then, I guess, and I, I wasn't quite sure what the philosophy there was. They would frequently release a single and then they would put it in the following album and uh, we did that Daydream Believer and it wasn't even in Pisces, Aquarius, Capricorn and Jones, it was in the album after that. So they had a, a kind of a strange philosophy of marketing going at that time, which I didn't quite understand. Uh, it's just one of the things they did. I guess they just didn't feel there was something that was quite strong enough for the to be the single or, or something like that, it must have been. Now with headquarters, the monkeys were suddenly given critical acclaim um, how did they and you react to this, and did this create pressure to make your next record be equally great? Well, uh, I guess there was a certain amount of, but there was always pressure, it seemed to me, that uh, all the time there was the, the record company leaning on us to get us get more records to them, and they wanted as much product as they could get because they were selling uh, like hotcakes at the time. And uh, I don't know, once they did that headquarters, they, I kind of felt I wanted them to do more just by themselves, but it it seemed to they seemed to be less uh, enthused about doing that once they had proven that they could do it with headquarters. They they just you know that that was their statement. They wanted to do their own thing and make their own little lovable album, and they did that. And once that was done, well, the TV show was they were working more on that and you know like i said before and uh, they just kind of didn't have time to pursue doing the tracks as much as uh, we would like to have had them you know and so uh, we had a, a few other guys play we had another drummer mainly and that was about it though peter would play the piano and as much as possible and i always played the bass on the later ones and mike would be in there for rhythm guitar and there was a lot of there was a lot of them in there the main difference was the most of the drums were handled by a, a fellow named Eddie Ho, Fast Eddie, as he called himself, uh, and that was the main difference on the on the Pisces album, you know. And there was a few little things, like we had a Paul Beaver do a synthesizer solo on one song, and Mickey did some on another. Although Mickey kind of didn't know what he was doing with his synthesizer, he was just twiddling knobs at that point, had no idea how to make it work, and then. One of those tunes, I think it was Daily Nightly or something like that, they, he just was twiddling dials <laughs> as we ran the track by him on this overdub, you know, <laughs> and had all kinds of strange sounds were coming out of that thing, some of which we ducked in the mix and others of which we kept in there. I listen to that now and it, it cracks me up, you know, it just, Mick, I could just re see him in there, he was just mad, like a mad scientist twirling these dials on the... <laughs> on the Moog synthesizer, you know, trying to get something on there on an overdub. It was funny. Now, the flip side, Going Down, is by far and away the most complex Monkees track. It's also a delight to listen to and appreciate the production work that went into it. Whose idea was it to record such an out-of-style song, and didn't Mickey sing the vocals on the final version all in one take? Yeah, he 
did, as a matter of fact. He did uh, the entire vocal in one take on that. But that song was, uh, I believe it was a jam session. In fact, there were several songs that were like that. There was No Time, I believe, and uh, Going Down. In particular, Going Down. Going Down was, after we did the track, The Daydream Believer, it was just kind of a release of tension. We just played this instrumental, and uh, I started doing some walk and bass and Mike was doing something and Peter was doing a little something and the drummer played something. We just we just jammed. And later on, we had this great jammed out track, you know, and uh, one of the Screen Gems writers put words to it. I believe it was Diane Hildebrand or someone like that, yeah. And uh, it became a song, you know. But uh, I think, now I, I may be wrong on that. It may have been the other one, No Time at All, that be, was the jam session one. Going down, I'm, it, but it seemed like it was just a wild jam session track that later got words written to it. Uh, I, I could be wrong, but that's that's the way it seemed to me, at the, as I recall. 20 years is getting to be a long time now to kind of remember what was going on back then, you know? Chip. I'm kind of curious why you and the Monkees parted ways, especially after producing Daydream Believer and Going Down, your last two contributions to the group. Well, that's a, uh, that's a good question. You know, everybody was uh, getting frustrated around that time. Everybody wanted to kind of do their own thing. And uh, Peter had songs that he wanted to produce with his people, you know, and he was getting a little band around him at the time. He had a... His girlfriend was playing drums with him and different people that he was hanging out with. So each each of the guys was starting to become a little more individualized, you know, and uh, in their entourage that they were hanging out with. And Mickey had his set of friends and musician friends that he would sort of collaborate with. And Mike had his friends and Peter had his friends. And Davey, well, he had a few friends, but not too much in the way of music. Yeah, he did later on. He, he he had different friends that he'd collaborate with. So they all, you know, they went off their separate musical ways, and it just seemed uh, kind of after a while I got to be the guy who was always trying to get them to hang together. And I guess they just kind of didn't want to do that so much. So maybe I became the, the, the guy that was uh, against what they really wanted to do, which was, hang out with their own separate friends and write their own separate songs and do their own separate thing and do their own separate productions. Everybody had ideas. You know, everybody kind of... It's funny with artists, I've run into that before with the Turtles that happen. You know, we have a very successful thing like, uh, oh, the last thing I produced with the Turtles was Eleanor. And thereafter, you get this feeling that the group says, okay, we did this one with you. Now we want to see if we can do it ourselves without you, you know. And I always would find that to be true with different people, you know. And I, I worked with Linda Ronstadt, and it was kind of the same sort of way, although we were going together at the time, and then we broke up after I made the album with her, and then, you know, we stopped working together. And people, they just, you know, they look to a different producer after a while. They say, okay, well, I know it's been successful, and but I, I want something else, so I'm going to try another producer or try to do it myself. You know, it's just... You get that I want to do it myself thing going against you if you're a producer, you know, because people look upon the producer as kind of the the boss in a way, you know, as the, the person who is sort of accepts the the final, you know, judgment on things, saying, well, is this adequate? Shall we leave it at that, or shall we, you know, work some more on it or something? And somebody has to decide, and so. Somewhere along the line, a producer becomes a guy who makes a decision to do something and release something or stop doing something or not do this tune or do this tune or whatever the case may be. And after a while, people just want to do their own thing. And I guess it was the case with the monkeys. You know, they just, just wanted to do their own thing. And Mike had his approach, which he felt I wasn't uh, into, you know, and Mickey had his approach. Mickey was a little more far out, you know, and he, he liked kind of the far out approach to things like that uh, Randy Scouse kit that he wrote and I remember we would we argued about that a bit you know and I said geez you know this it, it seems so peculiar to me you know I was I was very much commercial minded I guess wanting to get something that would you know 
was more normally acceptable. And I, after a while, I just kind of, you know, let Mickey do his own thing on Randy Skowski because I, I, you know, I kind of, I thought he was nuts, to tell you the truth on that, I with a kettle drum and everything, and it, it seemed so peculiar to me. But looking back, it was great, you know, and it was a great idea. And it was things like that, I guess, where we'd clash, and one guy would have one idea, and one guy would have another, that eventually, you know, makes people go their separate ways, you know. That happens a lot in the music business, I guess, you know. Unless you have a wonderful rapport that just works, and in the case of the monkeys, it just, it, they began to scatter apart as a group, and I would be the guy who was always hanging around at their houses and wishing all these various hangers-on weren't there, you know, so that we could just get the four guys together quietly and privately in a room and collaborate again, you know. And to me, all the various friends that were around them were just beginning to get in the way, and they were beginning to isolate them from one another, you know. And it, it was it was it was sad to me, you know, that uh, you know they didn't hang out together. They they you know after they worked together for 12 hours a day or whatever it was, they go their separate ways, and they they wouldn't want to see each other until they you know had to get back together and you know work on the set there, you know. So anyway, they were, that that was basically the reason, I guess. How did Christmas is My Time of Year come about, and why wasn't it officially released? Well, that was a. Uh, Howard Kalin, who is, uh, was the lead singer of the Turtles, and I were real good friends, and we'd hang out from time to time, and we were hanging around, I don't know, it was somewhere in the late 60s, it seemed like, uh, at my place, because uh, it was prior to the time I went back to Hawaii, which was in 1970, so it was around 69 or 68, when I was still working with the Turtles, and uh, he was sitting in my living room one day and he came up with this line you know christmas is my time of year and uh i kind of finished it off that's when there's love and good cheer and uh, stuff like that and uh then we wrote some words to it at the time which uh are much different than the words that i later put together for the monkeys version and uh we did a, a version of that which i think might be on some obscure rhino album somewhere with the uh, the Gospel Pearls in the background, Bessie Griffith and the Gospel Pearls, who were this group of five uh, black gospel singers who were kind of had this wild, far-out sound, you know. And I don't know, I got in the studio with Linda Ronstadt and Henry Diltz and Howard Kalin and Mark Volman and my friend Cyrus Farriar, I think, and we did this kind of, as I look back, it's a pr pretty terrible-sounding version of this record, you know. <laughs> And that was the first, and then uh, later on in 1976, I rewrote the song. I was so disappointed in that early version uh, and its strange approach to it with the gospel pearls in there and everything. And it, I mean, it was good, I guess, but, you know, I, I wanted more out of it. I don't know what I wanted from it. And I began to think it might be a good song for the monkeys, who I was, I was hanging around with Mickey and Davey at the time. And so I, I rewrote the verses and most of the song, actually, Howard Kalen. On um, the monkey's version, he's you know the first line of the chorus. Howard Kalen wrote, and I I wrote all the rest to it, and changed some chords around, and tried to make it a little more musically together than I felt it had been in the past. And then got in there one night in the studio with Peter Tork and myself and uh, Eddie Ho again, the drummer from Daydream Believer, and we did a track to it. And I, on my own money and stuff, I got Mickey and Davey in to sing it, and we put it together, mixed it down, and put a limited amount of them out at the time, although they just it just kind of laid there. And we didn't have any distributor to put it out, and I kept trying to find a record company to put it out, but then nobody was interested. You know, it was very tough after the Monkees uh, broke up and stuff uh, to get anything going for them again. It's been every year that <laughs> Christmas is my time of year comes back to haunt me, you know, and I keep thinking, geez, will we get it out this year? We almost had it out last year on Arista, but... Uh, Oh, the monkey's manager, Fishoff, I'll say this publicly, took too much time getting back to the guy who was in charge of getting the project out, and uh, it got to be November 7th, and he wouldn't return uh, the call from Arista, and so it's his fault if he's out there listening that the uh, monkey's Christmas record is not yet released. That's all I can say. I was, I was disappointed and uh, quite angry, as a matter of fact, that, you know, that a guy could be so busy, and it seemed like it might have done something. Who knows, maybe it's one of those records that's just destined to be an underground something for the rest of its life, you know. It, it doesn't matter much to me anymore. I've kind of, after this big peak of the monkeys, I figure, well, if 
it didn't come out in 1986 at the Christmas of 86. You know, it's going to be tough to ever get it there. Who knows? Someday Rhino may put it on an album or something. But, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. It, uh, I, I kind of always hoped that it would be the Monkees Christmas contribution and it would get in there along with Jingle Bell Rock and Rocking Around the Christmas Tree and all those others and be the one that the Monkees had out, you know. It, uh, but... Uh, who knows? For one reason or another, it it uh, has not gotten there an official release yet. Now, Chip, what's your reaction to the new album Pool It? And as it seems there's going to be more new monkey music in the future, are you going to have any involvement in that? Have you been approached to? And do you want to? And uh, maybe even the movie? Yes, I would be glad to be involved. Uh, I like that album. I thought the production on it was excellent. You know, it it, it had all the modern sounds of today. The only thing I was disappointed with on that album was the tunes themselves. I just thought the tunes were not that great, you know, for guys like the Monkees who could who could get any tunes they want, you know, and they've I I've heard stuff that they've written that is far better than to me a lot of the tunes that were on the album. Nothing against the writers and they were good tunes, but I just don't think they were great tunes, you know. And you need if you're the Monkees and you're you've got the budget and you've why can't you find great tunes, you know, <laughs> to put on that album? And, uh, you know, I, kept, I don't know. I would like to have been involved uh, at some point in May in the future. Who knows if I ever hear from them again. My main thing with them is that, you know, I feel that I always feel that I'd love to be involved and I could get them another hit single. Uh, and that hasn't come out of their new stuff lately, and uh, I don't know what it would sound like. You know, it would probably be far different from the modern stuff you hear nowadays. I I tend to like things of a different style. I like the rock and roll, Rolling Stones-like, Beatle-like uh, way of doing music, you know, and it's a lot different today with all the synthesizer parts and stuff that's in there, and I, I have songs that I write that have that type of approach too, but when I think of the monkeys, I, I don't think of that sound in particular. I, you know, a little of it, but I like, you know, the guitars, those rock and roll guitars. That's what I like to hear, you know. And I didn't hear enough of that on that album. There was one tune that had one good guitar part that stuck in there, but that to me is rock and roll, is those great guitar parts. Guys, you know, <laughs> why couldn't they hire Chuck Berry to come in and play some guitar solos, you know, on some of their new stuff? You know, that's what I'd like to hear. You know, that to me is the monkeys, that type of sound, you know, that's. That's what I would love to hear out of him, because Mickey can sing anything. You know, he can scream like James Brown. He can, he can out James Brown, James Brown. You know, and uh, I've heard him do it. You know, and uh, Davy has a real pretty voice. You know, and Peter has his style. Uh, one of my favorite Peter Tork records of all time, and is one of my favorite Monkey records is that Auntie Griselda. You know, and it's. Uh, I, I tend to think that's the style for Peter. You know, I'd like to hear him do more of that kind of stuff, funny stuff, you know, just, you know, uh, more Chuck Berry tunes. That's what I'd like to see him do, you know, to tell you the truth. Anyway. Chip, thank you very much for your total honesty and candor. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Chip. Keep in touch and have yourself a great Christmas and Happy New Year. Okay, thanks a lot to you guys and uh, to all the kids out there. Just want to say uh, thanks again and uh, all the best to you. And uh, keep plugging away, guys.